Does value investing even work anymore? That's a question that the Wall Street Journal is asking, especially as the Fed is eyeing to reduce rates by the end of this year. And that's something that I want to cover in this video. So guys, as you smash that like button, let me run that intro. What's up guys and happy new year. This will be my first video in a while. I took a bit of a break as there was a lot of change happening in my life, but we are back at it. And so let's get into this. So the Wall Street Journal published this article, Can Charlie Munger's Investing Playbook Still Work? Even he wasn't so sure. And essentially what they're saying is that value investing actually struggled during the long era of low interest rates. And Charlie Munger warned investors hunting for deals that they should get used to making a lot less money. And this is largely the thesis of the article and it's not wrong. So, you know, many investors, including myself, agree that the years of low interest rates following the 2008 housing crisis actually helped growth stocks beat value stocks. And really what's happening is that lower rates make it a lot cheaper, as they're saying here, for businesses to borrow, which of course turbocharges growth, but they also make stocks, particularly growth stocks, look more attractive relative to less risky ones. And then they say that here, where it tends to boost the shares of companies geared towards future growth more than underpriced value stocks. And so why is that? And the reason why that is, is because think about it, if you're using a discount rate to discount future earnings, but you expect interest rates, if you're gonna use that as a proxy for the discount rate, if you're gonna use interest as a proxy for the discount rate, you would just be using a lower discount rate for the future earnings. And so in other words, you're discounting them at higher values and thus lower rates make the earnings of currently unprofitable businesses, but the profit will come in later years more valuable because you're just discounting at a lower rate. And so that of course makes uh, growth stocks very valuable in a low and almost like a perpetually low interest rate environment. And even Charlie Munger acknowledged this where he said that investors had almost no choice but to own a few richly valued value tech behemoths just to keep pace with the market. And here's exactly what he said. I think value investors are going to have a harder time now uh, that there are so many of them competing for diminished uh, a diminished bunch of opportunities. Um, and his advice to value investors is to get used to making less. And, you know, less is... Uh, I guess subjective, but the way I think about less is I only generally target around 12 to 15% a year. Even that is high on the higher end. But you know, there's some growth investors out there that are targeting 30, 40% a year, which I think is absolutely nuts. If I can even do it on the lower end of, you know, that 12%, I'm fully comfortable. I forecast my portfolio at around nine and a half percent. So I'm very much targeting a higher number than even what I'm forecasting my portfolio at. Now, you could just say, just throw your money in an index and, you know, the index will probably do around 11% over time. I would suggest that that might not actually be the case because the index is so, especially the S&P 500 index is so heavily weighted with these tech names. It could very well struggle to grow over the next 10, 15 years. Uh, we don't know. And I really don't know. So I'd rather not do that personally, but you know, it's never recommendations or investment advice for you guys. And the article does bring receipts, right? The proof is really in the pudding. Look at this. On average though, value stocks did outperform growth stocks by about seven percentage points annually between 1970 and early 2007, but since the Fed slashed the benchmark rate to near zero when the banking crisis happened, notice what has happened to the returns of value securities versus growth securities. So growth securities have far outpaced value securities. And so this is essentially the thesis behind, you know, uh, just uh, essentially saying that because these things have run up in this way and because interest rates are expected to go down, we should expect this trend to continue. I wouldn't necessarily agree with that, but I think it is a valid thesis that they're making. And here's another chart from the article, but I think it proves the opposite of what they're trying to say. So here they're saying that the price to earnings ratio of the Russell 1000 growth security is above the average security, or I guess on average of the index itself is above 35 times earnings, whereas a Russell 1000 value is just under 20 times earnings. So I would say that the Russell 1000 value is probably appropriately valued. You know, the earnings are expected to grow significantly, and this is TTM earnings. So of course the PE would be higher, but my question is, um, and I didn't spell out perform correctly, but the question is because the gap has never been higher, it could suggest that value stocks are expected to outperform, not pout perform, despite what the article is trying to say. Now, I'm not saying that 
the uh, growth stocks are not going to continue to grow substantially. But what I am saying is that, you know, anytime you have this large gap uh, and you see that this large gap ha has not existed at this level, at least uh, as far as this chart goes back, my question is, does this converge a little bit? And by converging, uh, I guess you can have a couple of things ha happen. You can have the uh, uh, Russell 1000 decline a bit in terms of P, or you can have the Russell 1000 value increase a bit. But either way, it's going to outperform the Russell 1000 growth. So I don't know. You guys let me know in the comments what you think based on what you see on this chart and just based on what you're feeling. But overall, indexes are indexes. And you know, I've been on YouTube long enough where you can go through older videos and you know, you can see hits and you can see misses and it's totally fine. But really, I think that value uh, in this age of information is really hidden in plain sight. And I think there's lots of opportunities where we can find value and really outperform. You know, last year, I think I did the best I've ever done. I think it was close to 50%. I haven't ta tallied it all up, up yet, but I think it was close to 50. But the question is, how did that really come about? Because I don't invest in many of the tech names that a lot of people wrote up in 2023. Well, here's how it happened. You know, the biggest win in the portfolio was Gap. And, you know, on August 22nd, you know, we all had access to this uh, article that was written in the Wall Street Journal. Um, and what ended up happening was I think that the the truth is that this in this information environment, um, you know, I just mentioned that the value opportunities are hidden in plain sight. But I think what's the case here is that these opportunities are available to those that are willing to peel that onion back a little bit, uh, uh, just a few layers to understand exactly what's going on. And so, for example, with Gap, everybody knew that Gap had, um, you know, ch experienced challenges. But if you just pulled back the onion a little bit, you realize that they brought in the Mattel guy as their CEO. They brought in a Walmart guy to run um, uh, um, Old Navy. And uh, they were really, really focused on bringing down inventory, which they did, and turning the ship around. And so this was an easy value thing, at least for me to see. And the, the stock ran up considerably. And you can see it here where the shares were $9.57 in August, on August 22nd, when the article came out, I was late to pick up on this, really, because I was just mulling about it for a long time. But I eventually uh, uh, decided that the uh, article writer was correct. Um, I built up a sizable position in mid-September, and then you can see that this thing just ran. And really, I wouldn't have predicted that it would have ran that much, but it was nice to see, and it was a nice win in the portfolio. But here is a non-tech name that was an absolute value security that outperformed many of the tech names as well. And, and that's not the only one. Regional banking was another area where it was very easy to see value, especially in May when all the regional banks crashed and there was a ton of fear. This is exactly when not only did I invest in a ton of regional banks, I also made a comps tracker and I made a full course for you guys to understand how to review regional banks. And then I talked about them over and over again throughout the year. But, you know, you can see a lot of the low hanging fruit may be gone now with regional banks as this thing has recovered significantly. You know, very easy to see many investors who took big bets into the regional banking space up 50% on many of the names. But of course, there is still, I think, money to be made. But I think there's more risk than uh, reward in this uh, present environment, depending on the particular security that you see. But once again, this was a macro issue. Everybody saw it. You had to be asleep if you missed this. And uh, it was uh, an interesting way to make uh, a couple coins in 2023. And then taking a step even further back, this was a, a, a more pervasive item that I've been talking about since I began on YouTube. You know, I've been speaking about home builders since I came on the platform. And this has been my single largest position up until this month of January 2024. And the thesis with home builders, notice that this index is up 160%. Now, I'm not saying I captured that whole 160%, but I did think I captured a double on a couple. But the point that I'm making is that, you know, these themes, these uh, uh, short-term macro issues, the theme would be the home builders because the U.S. is just under, uh, underbuilt. The short-term macro issues, which is the pain with the home uh, with the banks, and you know, just one-off type individual security situations like Gap being undervalued, or you know, we saw H and R Block being undervalued. There was a time where we saw Crocs; it was very undervalued, and and so on and so forth. You know, Thor, Winnebago, like it just keeps going. Sprouts Farmers Markets. 
I'll shut up now. But the point that I'm making is that these opportunities are available for value investors. You just have to peel back the onion. Now, one of the things that really helps me identify these opportunities is oftentimes I'll do the research on the security. It's not at the price that I want it, but I'll put it on the tracker. And then every morning I tune into the tracker, like I just open it up and see where the price relative to the intrinsic value is for each of the securities that I have on the tracker. And that really homes me in and allows me to identify where to deploy capital uh, as the capital continues to come in or as capital becomes available as certain positions mature or I sell particular securities. And so I really think that the tracker is a huge value. And you can see that I keep the models up to date. Um, I generally update them at least annually, but generally biannually for most of the ones, especially the ones that are closer to the top where the share price uh, as a percentage of intrinsic value is uh, lower than 100%. And, you know, I opened up one for you that you can see, for example, Best Buy. I currently believe that it's trading at around 75% of its intrinsic value. And you can click on into this link right here and you can get into the Best Buy models to see exactly grand, in, a, in, a more, in, a, in an insanely granular way how I built up to this 101.2 uh, valuation. And so you can gain access to all of my research at just five dollars a month and you know we also have our monthly call tier and that's where i actually go over my research with you guys live and i ask you guys questions or ask you guys to ask me questions and so that's all available as well and so this is not stopping in 2024 and i do believe that as time goes on in this year despite the fact that the market does seem somewhat overvalued there will be opportunities and so overall I don't think value investing is dead. I want to know what you guys think, but I think that there's a lot of value to find. So stick with me on this channel. If you're not subscribed, hit that subscribe button and I'll see you guys later.